Okay, I think we can go ahead and get started. Um, so, so hello everyone and welcome to a webinar hosted by the Desert Landscape Conservation Cooperative. My name is Mo Carell. I'm a landscape ecologist with the Desert LCC's Landscape Conservation Planning and Design Team based out of Bird Conservancy of the Rockies. Uh, we're very pleased to have Patrick Christ and Cameron Scott from NatureServe here to present and demo the VISTA tool developed for conservation planning purposes. So thanks everyone for joining today. Um, and thank you to NatureServe for sharing this work with us. For some housekeeping, I'd like to remind everyone we are recording this webinar, so we ask everyone to please mute their phones and headsets unless you'd like to ask a question. We'll have time for questions throughout the webinar via the chat box option and at specific points in time using the raise hand function in the webinar software. Um, if you'd like to use that function, you can raise your hand on your computer by clicking the Participants tab and hitting the Raise Hand button on the bottom of the participants list. We'll call your name and you'll need to then unmute your phone. Um, also, if at any point you would like to make the presentation window full screen on your computer, you can hit the icon in the upper right hand corner of the presentation box um, with the outward facing arrows. So let's see, with that, I'm now going to hand it over to Patrick and Cameron. All right, great. Thanks a lot, Mo. Thanks for everybody for joining us. Um, good morning. Um, and just to clarify for anyone uh, who was not on my presentation, uh, I believe that was back in uh, September um, to the uh, Desert LCC Partners uh, Modrian Workshop. Um, this webinar was requested by people at that meeting to see more of the Nature Serve Vista software live. So we're going to have a shorter than usual um, overview PowerPoint. Um, and then I'm going to turn it over to Cameron and we'll tag team a bit on some live demo. So uh, go ahead and advance. Next slide. All right, so um, just to start orienting people to uh, VISTA, the tagline up there, conservation on the land, in the water, anywhere on the globe, um, is just indicating that unlike a lot of uh, NatureServe uh, software products, this does not come packaged with data. Uh, this is a best available data assessment and planning tool. And the panels there are just indicating a bit of the breadth of the types of things that VISTA has been put to. Um, and uh, I know that uh, a lot of you aren't anywhere near a coast, but the Desert LCC um, and I know our California partners there do have coastline um, on their boundaries, so we've done a lot of coastal marine applications as well with VISTA. So we won't be demonstrating that today, but I just want to have you keep that in mind. Um, and then just acknowledging our funders there at the bottom, we've had over $4 million contributed to the development of the tool and its endowment over the years. Next. So just a few basics. Um, VISTA is an extension to ArcGIS. Um, it's currently in a 10.3 release, so we try to keep up with the ESRI releases, and it's been out since 2004, so it's had a long track life to it. Um, we call it a, a broadly capable tool. We think of it being uh, this idea of a framework integration tool. Um, it's the idea that it interacts with a lot of other data and tools and things out there to uh, help integrate conservation into a variety of other types of planning and land and, and resource management activities. Um, it's also usable by a variety of skill levels. Um, I guess I'm a good example of that. I am not a highly trained GIS person, but I use VISTA daily. Um, and then we have full integrated uh, help, training, tech support, um, and so on available for it. And we've had a probably around 2,000 downloads worldwide um, since its release. Next. All right, so I won't uh, go through all the questions here, but I just want to use this as a way to orient you to the main components of VISTA. So uh, first we have conservation elements, and you can just click through these, Cameron. Uh, and so uh, conservation elements are basically the things that you care about um, or that you want to assess doesn't have to be biodiversity. That's definitely a strong point of VISTA, but we also do a lot of work, uh, say, with multiple use agencies, local governments, BLM, and so on, um, that put other land uses in as their conservation elements. So you can use it as a multi-objective tool. Um, so basically, we're looking at where are they, what condition are they in, um, how confident are we 
in their distribution as well as we can combine them into patterns of diversity and so on. The next component are scenarios. So those are the patterns of uh, land and water use and stressors and factors that can affect your elements for good or bad. So we can look at patterns of those, how much of those uh, different features on the landscape are there. And then we combine the first two and we have evaluations of our conservation elements. Um, and then we can answer questions about how are my elements doing now? How might they be doing under a future scenario? Um, where should I act? And what should I do? And we'll be illustrating a lot of this as we go along through the live demo. Okay, Just go ahead and click. OK, and so um, in terms of what VISTA helps you do, um, we didn't make this up out of nothing. So it really is designed around a lot of fairly well-established concepts, like doing cumulative effects assessment and applying the mitigation hierarchy, um, scenario-based planning, systematic conservation planning, green infrastructure, EBM, and so on. Um, it's also designed to support the complete life cycle of planning from uh, gathering initial data and expert knowledge through assessment, developing alternatives, selecting a plan, implementing that plan, and then supporting um, your ongoing uh, monitoring and adaptive management over time. And then VISTA is also designed to work at multiple scales. Um, this makes it somewhat unique among these type of decision support systems that typically have you intersect all your data with a, a planning unit. VISTA maintains all the data at its source resolution, so you can move among scales. Next. Oh, OK. Um, and also, uh, as I pointed out before, uh, VISTA works across any kind of environment, so terrestrial, freshwater, marine, and across all of those simultaneously. So now I'm going to step through the analytical process. This is basically what Cameron is going to be illustrating in a very rapid sense. So first of all, we have our conservation elements. So we've got maps, values, and the expert knowledge about them. And then we can combine those things together into what we call conservation value summaries. Those are weighted overlays that let us uh, examine a lot of pattern, patterns of value on the landscape. Then we next will characterize scenarios um, in terms of physically what's going on in the land, air, and water, and then policy types behind uh, things that are intended to retain compatible uses, uh, conservation, and so on. And you can have as many scenarios as you want. We usually start off with a baseline, and then we have future uh, trends, build outs, um, climate change, fire trends, invasive species trends, and so on. And then VISTA will intersect your elements with the scenarios and apply a couple different cumulative effects models. And coming out of that process, you have a lot of different evaluation maps and reports. Again, we'll look at those in some detail in the live demo. You can then uh, explore uh, areas within your map and understand you know, big red blobs of conflict, what's actually going on in there. And then you can turn uh, that tool within VISTA is called Site Explorer. You can t turn it into a site mitigation tool or a development review tool. Or you can use it to develop uh, whole new alternatives and plans. And then finally, we have interoperability with a tool many of you may have heard of or be familiar with called MarkSans. That's a spatial optimization tool. Um, and that makes it a lot easier to identify a set of efficient places to meet your objectives. Then you can bring those results back into VISTA um, and use the power of VISTA to specify what you want to have happen within sites. Um, revise your spatial design, say what kind of policy mechanism you want to use to implement it. It's basically the kind of steps you would typically take to create an implementable plan. Go ahead. Um, and then VISTA supports the adaptive management cycle. Um, and just if you want to back up one. Um, just pointing out that uh, it's very easy in VISTA to update any of the spatial or expert knowledge types of inputs in, so you can reassess things on the fly. Um, we all know plans are never implemented perfectly, so when you lose an area 
that you had intended, say, for conservation to a different kind of use. You can use VISTA to find a replacement uh, location and so on. So just, again, supporting that adaptive management cycle. Uh, so uh, next we'll move on to the uh, demonstration. And so we are going to use the Madrian Archipelago Rapid Eco Regional Assessment uh, Project uh, that was done in VISTA with a little bit of adaptation. Um, and Cameron will be demonstrating um, element input and overlays, um, what it takes to characterize a scenario and do the cumulative effects assessment. Um, I believe we've got a Mark Sand prioritization um, that he put together quickly just to show you how quickly you can do that with VISTA. Um, and then we'll look at the Site Explorer and how you um, examine sites, develop alternatives, and, and so on. Um, so again, feel free to pose questions in the chat box throughout the demo. And if we have some time at the end, we'll uh, just open it up to uh, uh, people to ask questions verbally as well. And just to note, um, if you are particularly intrigued, do you think you'd like to move on with VISTA, um, we are happy to schedule an agency-specific webinar uh, with you. All right, so let's go ahead and move on. Um, okay, so just a quick orientation. A lot of you are probably familiar with um, ArcMap. Um, and then when you get Vista, it just loads um, as an extension here with its own menu. So uh, you can access things here. As you start to build your Vista project, um, objects start to show up over on this side. Um, so for example, we can start building our conservation elements. and. Um, then as the objects are loaded, we can start to access the menu that is specific to them over on this side. And so, uh, for example, this is um, the map of the Madrian um, Arsenal. Um, let's see, why don't we pick out um, grassland, for example. So with our elements, um, again, there are maps associated with these. And I'll apologize for the delay. I'm on a little travel laptop. This works a lot faster on uh, Cameron's. Um, laptop. All right, and so then with each of these, I'll just stick with the ones that are loading faster. Um, so we can get to things like an element report, for example. So everything in Vista has a report associated with it. And so these are generated after all of the um, data is filled in, and so we just get uh, a little bit of metadata, essentially some distribution statistics um, are calculated, so number of occurrences and how many acres, uh, for example. Um, and then part of the expert knowledge that would have been filled in would be a list of what are the positive, neutral, and negative uh, features. We call them land uses, but features that occur within your scenarios. Um, and then you get a little map, which you could design it to look a lot better than that. Um, and so these are all uh, exportable <clears throat> kind of reports. You can put them online, or you can pop them into a Word diagram, for example. So um, I'll skip over some of this most basic stuff so we have the most time for the, the more complex things. You can see we had quite a few um, different elements in this project. Um, but I'll go ahead and move on then to um, conservation value summary. So we only did one of these. Um, and this is just a richness map. So basically, this is the overlay of all of your elements. And the darker the color, the more elements um, that exist there. We can pop over to the layer display so we can see that with the uh, darkest areas, we have up to 11 uh, of our elements overlapping in one place. And um, here you've got uh, the, a, a few different capabilities. One is that you can. Um, add in how the element habitat condition um, affects this result. You can add in confidence. You can add in a value weighting. So there's ways of exploring value uh, here, different sort of patterns. So concentrations um, of areas of high integrity. Uh, you could look for areas of low confidence to help with boosting up the data confidence, for example. Um, you can do filtering, so I could look at concentrations of only, um, say, regulated uh, species 
Uh, so lots of different capabilities there. Um, if we were to analyze this with a particular site unit, any kind of polygon unit, we could then get summaries and drill down uh, by those sites and see the content within uh, specific sites. Um, hey, Patrick, so this the, is Cameron. Yeah, are you back now? I am back. You is were, that um, better? Yeah, I think yeah. it maybe just talk a little louder, um, and then I think you're probably good to go. Great. All right. Uh, All right I'm going to stop sharing, and I'll let you take over. Perfect. Just let me know once you're seeing it. OK, you're up. We can see it now. Great. So, Patrick, I, I um, was away. So it looks like you just covered the conservation value summary. Yeah, I got us up through that. So you can go ahead and start in on scenarios. On the scenarios, OK. So the scenarios I do have are, a quick question. Sure. Go ahead. Um, so just this is maybe a very basic question. But with the Nature Service to tool, this is just a plugin that you add to ArcGIS. And then you add data directly to it, and it automatically organizes it in this fashion for you? Or are you kind of led through a step-by-step -step process to, to drive that organization? How, how does a little bit of the back end work here? Yeah, that, sure. that's right. It, it is an extension. <clears throat> so you can just go to natureserve.org slash Vista and go ahead and register and download it. Um, and then, um, yeah, there's, there's basically three data components here. There are the elements, um, and then, well, basically just really the two. There are the elements, and then there are the scenarios, and then there are, are things that you do with those. And so, <clears throat> again, there's a whole process built in with the help manual, uh, which we haven't shown, but that's in the main menu there. Um, so, yeah, there's, there's a framework for Vista, so when you're ready to add, say, uh, species data, um, ecosystem data, you would say, OK, I want to add an element. And then Vista has an interface that's going to walk you through populating all of the spatial and non-spatial data uh, for those things. So you know, I, I don't want to downplay it like you just throw data at it and it's uh, artificial intelligence that knows what to do with it. You know, it's a big, broad, complex tool. So um, you are going to step your way through it. But when we do trainings, they're all modular trainings that we do through GoToMeeting. And so uh, people are able to basically build the project as they work through the modules. So it's kind of a eat the elephant one bite at a time kind of approach. Okay, right. thank you. I'll, just, uh, I'll add to that that, um, so as Patrick was mentioning, it's not exactly like a wizard that will step you through each individual step, but the properties windows that you use to build each of these components will tell you if there's a required data set that you're missing, um, and there's help available through the interface if you're unsure about what individual uh, data inputs are. And another point just on that, because it is within the ArcMap tool, uh, you see that it's there, this within the table of contents list, there is a standard ArcMap table of contents where you can add any data you like, and it's organized um, however you organize it. And then Vista will add in the analysis scenario and elements groups, and those, as well as the element CVS, and those are added by Vista, but you can add other layers in and make them visible or or hide them depending on your needs. So it's it's that's one way in which it's very compatible with using data from multiple tools is you can just pull them into ArcMap and use them. So looking at the scenarios, which are the the objects that contain all the land uses and policy types for your project area. So in this case, you see there are quite a number of different scenarios. This particular project wanted information broken out um, for different types of elements in different ways. And so we have a lot of different scenarios. We'll look at the one for terrestrial ecosystems. And I'm going to open up the properties for it. And you'll see that it's giving us all of the data that's included in this scenario. So we can see the data set that it's 
being pulled from here on this left column. And then in this right column, I'm not sure if Patrick showed you with the elements, but there are there's a land use list. And that list is tailored for each individual project. And although there is a default list available at the very beginning um, that you can tailor or replace it in whole. And that list is what you use to identify what an individual element's response is to uh, a land use, whether it has a positive, negative, neutral response. Uh, you can also here in the scenario translate your input data into those land uses. And so you build up, and the, the building or the creation of a scenario can be a little bit of an art in terms of how things are organized. But you have two basic functions. You can either have data from one uh, input override data from another input. So where they overlap, there is only one of them will occur. Uh, you can also have them uh, in this combined feature so that they can co-occur in the same pixel. Yeah, so you so have things like, yeah, go ahead. Uh, well, just, yeah, we probably don't want to get too technical, but yeah, the ba basic idea here is um, you guys go ahead and create a classification of everything you expect to come <clears throat> within a scenario. Again, all your land uses, stressors, protected areas, conservation practices, all that stuff that you think can affect your elements now or in the future. Create the classification. Here you're pulling in data, you're crosswalking it to that classification. And then we give you a few other tools that are really just intended to have the most realistic starting baseline scenario possible. That, you know, if you were to fly over the landscape, you know, you, this is what you would see um, as accurate as possible because you want to get a really good, precise evaluation of how your elements are doing under that scenario. So this stage really is just all about setting up that baseline scenario. And then from there, it's very easy to make a copy of this and then do a few minor tweaks to create um, future scenarios. So say add in future urban modeled growth or climate change effects or something like that. You don't have to redo this each time. So the lion's share of the time is spent getting this baseline scenario correct and then building the different types of future trend scenarios uh, is a pretty easy job after that. Right, and so once you've you created this structure, this is going to go ahead and take all of those input data, and it's going to generate a raster stack of converting all those data sets into those standardized land use uh, list categories. And so for example here, I can turn on a couple. We have um, identity development areas. We have in here, uh, Invasive species cover, so darker blue being higher invasive species cover and lighter being lower. Um, we have mines and land cells, which will show up in black. Uh, and so this is going to use this, as you see, it's the footprint of what all those land uses are. All right, I'm going to turn this off. And, and just to mention for people, the reason why it's a stack of layers instead of one flat map is that we do allow more than one thing to be going on in the same pixel in a scenario. That's part of the cumulative effects assessment. So you can have a pixel that might have a grazing land use, an invasive species, a particular fire regime, and so on. So we want to know that all of those things are going on in the same place at the same time and be able to do that cumulative effects assessment against that. Right, and tying into that, so I met, we mentioned that in the element itself, you can establish a categorical response of positive, negative, neutral to a land use. Uh, you can also set up a landscape condition model, which you can then assign a, a score between 0 and 1, identifying the site intensity impact of a land use on um, a particular element. And so a score higher 
closer to one involves lower impact or, or more pristine condition remaining in the presence of that land use. A score closer to zero uh, indicates a lower condition remaining, so a higher impact. And this ties into what Patrick was just saying with the cumulative effects. Uh, these, in the categorical analysis, the lowest response. So if there's a negative response, then the element will have a negative uh, compatibility in that pixel. In this case, the individual site intensity scores, along with their distance effects, will be combined in each pixel uh, so that you get a, a more nuanced view of what the condition is throughout the, the area. And then you can set a threshold for an element saying, if the condition is above a certain value, it's compatible. And if it's below a certain value, it's not. And so we'll see some maps that demonstrate that. So using that model, I ran a, an evaluation on this scenario for the terrestrial ecosystems. And it's going to generate, when I expand it, you see it's generating all of these different analysis results. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to start from the bottom and, and move up. Um, the first result that we're going to look at is a wall-to-wall -wall condition map of representing the model we just looked at based on the scenario inputs um, for the scenario. And so areas with high density development are going to show up uh, because they have a very high impact. Um, they're going to show up in red. Areas that have either very few land uses or no land uses or that the land uses existing there are a very low impact based on the model are going to show up in darker green. So this gives you a, a general view of the condition of the landscape based on a particular model. This then will also take that condition model and then clip it to each element's distribution. So in this case, we're looking at the grasslands. So we're seeing the condition based on that model limited only to the distribution for this element. Uh, and so the, the areas that maybe came out as very red in the full wall-to-wall -wall res results may not show up depending on the, for the distribution faults for an element. We can also look at that result averaged out to a site layer. So in this evaluation, we included a site layer. A site layer can be any polygon layer where the polygons don't overlap. Uh, so it can be either a continuous grid, like we used in this case. These are the four kilometer grid cells that were used for the, the prism analysis, uh, climate analysis. Um, you can use watershed data, so HUX, HUX 12, or 10. You could use parcel data, or you could use maybe uh, sites like national parks or BLM lands where the, the polygons are going to be in certain areas but not wall-to-wall. Uh, -wall. They won't cover everything. So it's very flexible in that way. And then the results of the analyses will be available in this summarized form just to, to get a general view of what the average um, condition is. And then we'll also be using those site layer polygons in the Site Explorer tool. So once VISTA has the condition of every element within the scenario, it can start evaluating the compatibility. Um, so as I mentioned, there can be a condition threshold set. And if we look at the compatibility, what we're seeing is just a, a binary result of, well, in this case, a binary result. Uh, if we included policy types, we could uh, have a, a more, an additional one or two categories. But we're seeing blue areas where the condition is above the condition threshold. So the element is compatible with the land uses in those areas, or 
the red areas indicate a condition that's below the condition threshold for the element. So the element is not compatible. And this is just a straight compatibility with the land uses. Hey, Cameron, we have a couple of questions. We have a couple of questions. Okay. Oh, yeah. All right. Yeah. Uh, so first one is, what are the smallest grid or polygon areas possible? I'll go ahead and let you answer that. Sure. So there's no, there's no limit um, necessarily uh, on the, the size of the grid or the polygon. Um, the main limits are going to be based on the, the processing needs. So depending on the scale um, of the polygon you want, if you want a very large area for your project and a very small scale polygon or raster set, that may overload the system. Um, so, but if you're looking at a smaller, more localized area, the, you could use a, a finer scale, so maybe five meter. For this analysis, for this project, we went with a 30 meter result, or 30 meter raster analysis scale. And the project area is fairly large. So 30 meter has worked for us for some pretty large projects. If you went down to five meter or 10 meter, there would be, you might start running into some issues in terms of memory um, capacity and processing capacity. And uh, just to point out too that so the the data is processed in a grid, so you know ten meter, thirty meter, uh, whatever seems reasonable for what you're trying to do. And then in terms of the site units, we often uh, use we'll do the analyses with uh, may, maybe two or three different site units. One might be more of a, a management unit where we want to summarize performance for, let's say, a BLM field office or something like that, um, versus then we're thinking about a, an actual planning or geo design sort of unit where you know we might be working with a 10-acre uh, unit or a one-acre unit where we then want to. That's where we want to actually create a plan. So those uh, polygons are going to have different purposes. Um, the other question was, can the uh, site units um, be queried on the fly uh, so that, you know, basic answer is you can query those um, on the fly using your standard arc view functions to query those. In terms of getting that full set of results um, for a site unit, Cameron's going to get to that in a minute through a function called Site Explorer. Um, and Cameron, we have 20 minutes left, so we should probably move along uh, pretty quickly to get through the rest of it. All right, so um, the viability, just really quickly, built on compatibility. It, it takes the compatibility and it factors in uh, the, this concept of minimum size for viability. And so it allows us to filter out areas that are too small. While they may be compatible, they're too small for long-term viability. And so all those are element-based. And then Vista will also roll those up into a compatibility conflict map, which will show us areas of, um, that have a higher number of elements in conflict. So darker red, higher number of elements in conflict. And then the tan area indicates presence of an element but no conflict. And we have that for compatibility as well as viability. So. And we should show the report also. So when you run this evaluation, there's a, a report that's generated. As, and there are reports similar to this for Site Explorer or for the uh, conservation value summaries, as well as the elements. And the reports capture the, um, the basic details of a, a, an object, so what the inputs were um, in this case just the name, cell size, uh, what elements were included, you know, if there was a filter, if we have a goal set, um, what that was, and in this case, a site layer. And then it'll also show us for the elements that were evaluated, you know, how, how did they do in this scenario, um, and how, how close are they to reaching their goals? So we have a 100% goal right now, just so you want to protect 100% of the area. Um, and so this is showing us for each element, basically, what percentage of the element's distribution is viable. Um, 
because we have 100% goal. And so you would see we have the full distribution, number of occurrences, average condition for the element, and then the, the viable area, and the, the average condition of viable areas, and then the overall percentage of our goal. And I had mentioned and so these uh, earlier that we have, um, you have the option of adding policy reliability in here. So uh, we didn't do that on this, but uh, you have the option to check off which policies that are supporting conservation are reliable when you do this scenario evaluation. In that case, you'd get a second column in here that would tell you how much is viable but also protected, meaning supported by reliable policies. Right. And so these can be useful just as a, an archiving or reporting format. Um, you can also use these to quickly provide information to other users uh, about individual components. And all of these links, if you click on them, lead to other reports for individual elements or, in this case, down below for the condition system that was used. So you have the inputs that were used or the input scores in that landscape condition model, all available, so all the metadata roughly that, that was used or, or is necessary for this evaluation, you can get through these reports. So looking at, I'm going to switch over to a categorical analysis. This is the same evaluation, but instead of using the conditional uh, result responses, we're using the categorical responses of positive, negative, neutral. And I'm going to open up Site Explorer. So this is going to allow us to query individual or, or groups of sites in the project area and see what is going on within those sites. So when I, when I click on this, this is generating all of the data it's gathering all the data for the sites on the fly. So if something has changed in the project, if scores have been updated or if the scenario has been modified, it's just going back and checking. And it will either tell you that something needs to be refreshed uh, or it will recalculate, if it can, that data so that what you're seeing is consistent with the latest data in the project. Um, so that your first option is, well, first let me turn on, so when you're selecting your sites, you may know individual sites that you want to choose. Um, but you can also display any reference map that, that is useful. So if you wanted to look at an area of high conflict, you could see what was happening there. Or if you wanted to look at an area of low condition um, or potentially a non-VISTA reference point, uh, you can open up that map, and it will display behind the grid and help us select things. Um, speaking hey Cameron, while, oh, I was just going to say, while you're waiting, we do have a couple more questions if you want to take any. They're technical uh, questions. Let me answer, sure, let me answer the question about the selection of sites. So in terms of querying, you, you can, through this interface, select uh, sites based on some attributes. So it's not a very sophisticated query. You can't pull together a lot of different logicals, but you can, let's say, select um, all sites owned by a particular property manager, you know, a particular property owner, um, assuming that that data is in the attribute layer. And we can take the other questions. Okay. One was, um, it was following up on the, you know, querying polygons on the fly is, can you click on a pixel and see what elements comprise them? You can't click on um, a pixel. So just to differentiate, these analyses are run, and the results are generated at 30 meter pixels. So they're, fairly, they're very fine grained. Um, you, could, you could look at a conservation value summary map um, and see the richness in an individual pixel. So you can start getting a ton of that information that way. Within the Site Explorer tool, you can select a site. So it's going to be generally coarser than pixel level. Um, but it will show you what elements occur there and, and a lot of other data. So, and we'll see that. Okay. So and I'll you can go, go ahead and get a, site load, yeah, get a site loading. And 
so another one is, um, can photos be used for polygon fill? Um, I'm not sure I understand what they're really trying to get at with that. Okay, well, why don't we save that one? If we have time at the end, we can uh, unmute Tim and uh, let him verbalize that one for us. But let's keep going with okay. this part of the demo. Yeah, a short response would be photos as is are just can't use photos as they are. Um, but if they were converted to polygons, then just would be able to use them. But yeah, maybe we can get some more information after that. So you see here I've selected a, a section of um, sites, a little group. You can use a drag and drop box. You can draw a polygon um, with clicks or freehand. You can also draw a line. So depending on what you're trying to do, um, you know, if you're trying to map out a pipeline, that's not too difficult using the, the line freehand picture. Um, and the polygon can also be useful if you have a, a specific site in mind or a specific area in mind that's not easily selectable. And so maybe just to, to give a little storyline of why we picked any particular area. So again, what Cameron has up in the background is the results of the scenario evaluation. And he picked an area with a, it's dark red. They're showing a lot of conflict with a lot of elements. And so at first we just want to see, you know, what elements are in there and what what's going on with the scenario, what's driving that conflict. These would be the steps one might take before they decide, do I want to make a change to that place or not? Right. And so the information you're getting here is the upper window. And this contains element information. Uh, so you have the element name, total area, compatible area, percent compatible, um, and the response. Um, these columns are modifiable, so there, there are a large number of options in terms of what statistics are generated by this site explorer tool. You can select any of these and bring them in and, and see them. Um, this can play a chart up right now. It's the entire, the, the width of the chart represents the, the goal for the element. So in this case, 100% distribution the width of this chart represents the full distribution of the element. Areas in green represent compatible areas. Areas in red represent incompatible areas. And the areas that are darker red, which you can see a little bit slice up here, represent the incompatible areas within the selected site. So you can get a, a really broad view of how an element is faring, as well as what the, the selected site what the potential is in the selected site to address um, the overall goals for that element. So in this case, for the Apaturian, Chihuahuan, semi-desert grasslands, um, we can see that there's a lot of incompatible area. And we can see that the selected site would deal with some of it, but not a great deal. Uh, this is a particularly widespread element for elements that have a much smaller distribution or that are maybe restricted to very small locations throughout the project area, you could have just even an individual site representing a huge portion of the, the overall goal. And so you, this lets you see quickly whether or not you can get really big bang for your buck um, or if all your efforts are going to maybe get you a little further but not as far as you want. So that's all the element information. And you can also see what the land uses are within the selected sites. So you, you have the area of the land use here. And then you have what the land use category is. And so you can go through and find areas that are larger. And so here we have severe fire regime change. 11,000 hectares uh, are covered by severe fire regime change. Um, so that's one thing that is widespread in the selected sites. If we, select, if we clicked on that, we could also see what the response categorically is for um, 
for the uh, individual elements. And some elements might have a negative, some might have a positive, depending on the land use. And then we also see that there are some pixels. So all of the initial pixels at the top here are, there's only a single land use represented in the pixel. But because we can have multiple land uses represented in the same area, um, all those combinations are also being shown here. And so just going by the, the, the color, the legend for the land use, we can see that fire regime departure is spread throughout. We can also see that um, these red terrestrial invasive land uses are, are popping up in a large number of places. And, and so this gives you an idea. You can start looking at what's in the selected sites. Um, are the, the land uses that are there that are impacting elements something that we want to address or that we can address? Um, and if so, how much of an area are, you know, do they take up within the selected area? And, and how would addressing those particular land uses have a, an impact? And so if you wanted to, if you wanted to just say, let's say, provide a particular treatment. So let's say you wanted to do a vegetation treatment um, within the selected sites. This will allow you to do an override. So this is just a, a pretty coarse override. It's going to say, if we converted the land uses in the selected area to this particular land use, um, what, what would that mean? What would that do? And so it's, it's churning away right now, but we'll see the, the override will replace everything here. Um, it's going to show us some updates within the element features. So we see the response is now shifted to positive for these. Um, and we see that the compatible area um, chart now reflects, instead of that dark red line, we see that it's a dark green. So that, that particular piece has been switched to a compatible land use. And you can hover over to see exactly how much area that would change. So it's, it's a little coarse. Uh, vegetation treatment is not going to address um, or, you know, high density development areas. Um, but then you can save this result out and it'll save a polygon of the sites that are selected for that land use, which you can then incorporate back into a scenario, uh, let's say an alternative treatment scenario, and, and structure that, land, that vegetation treatment within your scenario and then reevaluate to see really uh, at a finer grain detail what the effects of that treatment would be. So Karen, um, we have five minutes left. Yeah. Uh, so do we want to look at the Mark's hand results just really quickly, or are there any questions uh, that people want yeah, to Yeah, we, uh, we don't have any more questions, so uh, you uh, can just quickly, I mean, we don't need to look at it in detail, but just explain the sure. better operation. Yeah, so VISTA has a wizard that will step you through using an evaluation to generate input files for the Mark's hand tool. Um, so it'll, it'll build for you, you know, what elements are being evaluated, um, do they have any weightings, or should some elements be higher priority, treated as a higher priority than others. Uh, it allows you to lock in or lock out specific sites. Um, all of that information, and it will generate uh, a, a set of Marxian input files that you need. Once those are generated, you can run those through the Marxian tool. And you can capture the results once, once you get the outputs from Marxan. You can specify where those are and um, what, you, what shape file you want to save them to. And you can capture your Marxan results. And so in this case, I just did uh, a really quick Marxan analysis based on the terrestrial ecosystem elements in that evaluation that we looked at. And I tweaked some of the, the, the variables. So you need to have a baseline knowledge of 
or foundational knowledge of what Marxian does and how to use it. Um, <coughs> and, and then I ran a Marxian prioritization analysis. And so this is showing us the sum of solutions. So for a thousand runs, how many solutions included a particular site? These dark blue areas were included in uh, you know, 90% to 100% of the runs. The light yellow areas were included from 0 to 10% of the runs. And so this gives you a, a, a more or less a measure of irreplaceability of an individual site. The areas that are in between may be beneficial you know, if you can get to them, but maybe less irreplaceable than the areas in darker blue. And so, so this can help you. So in workflow, uh, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say, yeah, this can help you identify areas that you might want to focus on. And so you might want to select maybe some large initiative to protect uh, a large area up here. You can bring that information back into Vista, um, either using the Site Explorer tool first to select those sites and see what is going on, um, or saving them as a, a, a clipped polygon layer that you incorporate back into a scenario. And okay, uh, I'll let you, Patrick, go ahead. Yeah, so I, I think we only have a couple minutes, so we'll, we'll just wrap up. So uh, we know this is always like drinking water from a fire hose. Um, this does quite a lot. Uh, but basically keep in mind it, it's a, a way to integrate a lot of data about the things you care about and expert knowledge about them, uh, understand patterns of value across the landscape, then to be able to assess how your elements are going to do under various scenarios. Um, and then create a plan, and that can range from an individual site. So just saying, you know, do we want to have this kind of development go here? Do we want to uh, try to improve condition through vegetation treatment? What do we want to do at the site level? But then interacting with Marksan to point the direction to creating a whole new alternative for our planning region, and then implementing that plan and uh, uh, conducting adaptive management over time. So we just wanted to summarize with that. I realize we're about um, out of time. Uh, we could probably stay on a few more minutes if the um, uh, web meeting doesn't cut out. Um, I'll leave that up to Mo. Uh, but otherwise, we'll say thank you very much for your interest and attention, and uh, happy to take questions if we have time. Yeah, um, let's go ahead and we'll end the official webinar. And for those of you that are interested in staying on a few minutes longer, you're more than welcome to do so. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for participating. And thank you again, Patrick and Cameron, for taking the time to be with us today. Um, as a reminder, this webinar was recorded and made available on our YouTube channel. So if you'd like to access our channel on our website, you can search for the Desert LCC YouTube, and it'll pop right up. Um, once again, thanks, everyone, and have a great day.